I sat down on my computer and nearly had a heart attack. Chrome was front and center and incognito mode. Oh crap, I thought to myself, where I leave open? I quickly scanned the open tabs and breathed a heavy sigh of relief when I failed to find any pornography. My wife understands that I occasionally view adult content. She claims to be perfectly fine with it. She claims it is healthy, like going for a walk. Nevertheless, despite her acceptance, I feel compelled to hide the evidence as much as possible. If it's not porn, then what is it? I saw four tabs and none of them were mine. My wife was on the computer last. She must have been aiming to hide her tracks, but forgot to hit the tiny white X in the upper right hand corner. Why would she want to browse the web in secret? She couldn't possibly be up to something. We've been together for years. Sure, we had our, our ups and downs, but we, we persevered. Our relationship has been pretty transparent, and as far as I could tell, we were great at communicating our problems with each other. Four incognito tabs suggested otherwise. I didn't need this. I could feel the maddening creep of paranoia pulling me in irrational directions. Am I just stressed out? I'm just stressed out. That's all, I thought. Work's a living hell. I loathe everything about it. My boss, my coworkers, the endless Excel spreadsheets, all these emotions I was experiencing, simply my brain externalizing my anxiety onto my innocent wife. But the uncertainty felt like a stomach ulcer. One that I could easily fix. I had a look. Just a quick peek. I know, I know, this is an egregious violation of the sanctity of marriage. And enduring relationship is based on a bedrock of trust. The mere act of unsanctioned snooping undermines this trust. But still, I was curious. She never left an incognito window open before. Let alone four. The nagging pangs of jealousy felt like toxin in my bloodstream. I wouldn't be able to calm down until I learned the truth. I opened the first tab. Grandma's chocolate cupcake recipe. The website went into explicit detail describing how to bake two dozen perfect cupcakes. Chocolate, butter, sugar, eggs, flour, baking powder, salt, milk, and vanilla. Huh. Not even the barest hint of infidelity. I could feel the anxiety instantly leak away, so... That's what she's up to. My birthday's tomorrow! She knows how much I adore baked goods. I actually felt a bit guilty. I should have trusted her. Instead, I ruined a loving birthday surprise. I decided I wouldn't say anything. I would mock surprise with an Oscar-winning performance. These are amazing, I would say. You know me so well. A wriggling worm at the back of my neck reminded me that there was still three more tabs. No. Nope. Not again. I had already ruined one birthday surprise. I'm not going to do it again. Once more, I could feel the onrush of anxiety rising up. My chest tightened. My focus wavered. One quick peek would not hurt. I wasn't always like this. My job has me jumping in shadows. My boss constantly berates me in front of my coworkers, and they just join in, laughing, mocking me. I used to be laid back and happy-go-lucky. Now I was overly suspicious, always looking over my shoulder. It's amazing the extent to which a hostile work environment can change your outlook on life. Every night I have to ingest a narcotic cocktail of prescription sleeping pills and vodka just to settle down. I convinced myself that I could not function until I checked the next incognito tab. I was not in the mood to fight it. Besides, I already looked once. The next incognito tab was titled Flavorless Poisons. I froze. In an instant, I was awash with both shock and disbelief. Why the hell was she researching flavorless poisons? I scanned the website. It described in detail various concoctions that could be used to secretly kill. It documented cyanide and arsenic and highly toxic substances made from potatoes, nicotine, and rotten meat. There was an extensive write-up on ricin, an extraordinarily toxic substance derived from castor oil beans. According to the website, the unstoppable death spiral of an exposed victim begins with vomiting and diarrhea. It resembles food poisoning, but with ample amounts of blood. These symptoms were soon followed by severe dehydration, low blood pressure, and brain-rattling seizures. In a few days, the liver, spleen, and kidneys stop working, resulting in an excruciatingly painful death. Apparently, a dose of ricin, as small as 0.3 milligrams, can be fatal. 
Exposure can occur when ricin is touched, inhaled, or ingested in food. That last line stuck with me. Why would she be looking at recipes and poison at the same time? I didn't take any monumental mental gymnastics to put two and two together. She was planning on poisoning me on my birthday. No, that's nonsense. That's nonsense, I thought. I was making massive assumptions here. Maybe she was curious. Everyone Googles stupid questions. Yesterday, I Googled whether guinea pigs farted. <laughs> I have no motivation beyond silly inquisitiveness. I just wanted to know. Google does not punish dumb questions. I was being suspicious again. Next tab would determine the truth of the matter. The third tab was titled, How to Make Ricin at Home. The page gave detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to prepare the poison. There were pictures, diagrams, and a handy video guide. So, this is her plan, I thought. The tutorial seemed pretty easy to follow, and for all I knew, she was already brewing up a batch somewhere. Maybe there's a cup of rice and waiting for me in the fridge right next to the milk. Nonsense. Nonsense. It's not like we had a bucket load of castor oil just sitting around the house. Unless I could prove otherwise, her efforts at poisoning me were exploratory. I had to calm down. I could hear the words of my boss echoing in my head. Why are you always so anxious? Is there something wrong with your brain? He was an asshole, but maybe he was right. One time to go. It all came down to this. No point in hesitating now. I, I clicked on it. It was an order form for castor beans. The words, thank you for your order, dominated the center. I could not believe it. There is nothing worse than having your paranoid delusions affirmed with concrete and undeniable facts. A part of me still held on to the beliefs that my concerns were all a fantastic construct within my imagination. But then I looked back at the tabs and the truth was undeniable. All doubt was sucked out of my mind. She was planning on poisoning me. I heard the sound of creaking floorboards behind me. I quickly closed the browser window. My wife leaned into the doorframe. You coming to bed soon? It was nearly midnight. Yeah, I'll be there in a moment, I said. There was no way. I was going to fall asleep by natural means. I went to the kitchen, poured myself a glass of vodka, and opened the medicine cabinet. I swallowed a handful of sleeping pills, and I went to bed. The next morning, standing in the kitchen next to the rumbling coffee maker, my wife kissed me on the forehead and said, Happy birthday, hon. I'll have a big surprise for you when you get home tonight. Ah. Uh, you don't have to do anything special for me. No, really, please don't. I wanted to work with my future poisoning lingering in my mind. Somehow my co-workers found out it was my birthday. They used the opportunity to ridicule me and call me old man. They took things from my desk and hid them. When I politely asked for my stuff back, the boss said, What stuff? Looks like someone's coming down with Alzheimer's. <laughs> and they sang their own unique rendition of Happy Birthday at lunchtime. Instead of the word dear, they inserted the word worthless piece of crap. It all felt coordinated and rehearsed. On a normal day, I would have been traumatized. Today, it barely registered. After work, I returned home and my wife awaited me at the front door. Happy birthday, she said before giving me a big hug. Along the wall, she hung a decorative banner with my name on it. Thanks, babe, I said with a little enthusiasm. I looked and felt sour. I did not feel like dying today. But I didn't want to let on that I invaded her privacy. Rough day at work? She asked. Well, I have a surprise that will chill you right up. Put my hand up and stopped her before she could continue. How about I make us a pot of coffee first? I asked. She smiled and squeezed me again. Oh, well. Even though it is your birthday, you do make much better coffee than me. I watched her disappear into the dining room. How could she be so positive and upbeat? She was about to murder me! I was not going to die quietly. I had a plan. If she was going to poison me, I was going to return the favor and take her down with me. I made two equal-sized cups of coffee. Then, I went into our medicine cupboard. I grabbed nearly a full bottle of my prescription sleeping pills. I ground them all up into a fine powder. By this point, the coffee had finished brewing, so I filled both cups with steaming liquid and filled her cup with the ground-up pills. Then I added creamer to both cups. I brought both cups of coffee to the dining room. My wife sat at the table, smiling contently at me. 
Thanks, I love your coffee. Did I ever mention that? She took two big swigs and placed her cup on the table. I sat down beside her. Time for your surprise. She drew back the cloth that covered the table. In front of us were a dozen delicious looking cupcakes. I know you've been so stressed out with all the douchebags at work, so I wanted to make you something special. Oh, they're amazing, I said. You know me so well. I didn't realize I was such a great actor. I held the deadly morsel in my hand and examined it closely. It looked like a benign cupcake. It smelled like it was fresh from a professional bakery. How could so much evil reside in such a delightful treat? I guess... It was time to die. I took a huge bite, stuffing the cupcake into my mouth. Oh, it was delicious. Everything that a cupcake aspires to be. I wondered how long it would take for the poison to kick in. Would it be gradual or sudden? Would I fade away peacefully in my sleep or be violently wrenched, kicking and screaming into death? I ate the whole thing and I swallowed every crumb. Ready for your second surprise? She pulled back another towel and unveiled another dozen cupcakes. More cupcakes? I asked. Special cupcakes, she said. I want you to bring these into your work and leave them in your lunchroom. You must promise me that no matter what, you will not eat one of these cupcakes. Why's that? Because these cupcakes are laced with ricin. I want to make your work situation better, so I figured bioterrorism was the way to go. So, the cupcake I just ate... Was that poison too? No! Goodness no! Why would I poison my sweetheart? She said, swallowing the last of her coffee. Thanks, I said. I really appreciate it. I'll bring them in tomorrow and kill them all. What have I done? She gave me a big hug and retreated into the kitchen. I grabbed one of the rice and cupcakes and I shoved it into my mouth. I replaced the gap with one of the non-poison treats. I should have trusted her. I should never have checked her incognito tags, and now I've killed her. At least I wouldn't have to live for very long with the guilt. I felt beyond horrible. Only thing that would help now was a glass of milk. I talk to houses. I have ever since one has tried to kill me. Every house has a ghost in it. That's what my mother used to tell me, and I've always known that it's not just some dumb superstition. I don't believe her when she tells me that you need to apologize to tree spirits before peeing in the woods, or that you have to avoid the number four at all costs, but I believe her. But she says that every place that people live in is also occupied by one of the dead. Now, they're not always human ghosts. In fact, they rarely are. It takes an old house, one with a lot of history, to bind a human soul. A small apartment might be haunted by a ghost of a mouse, even a beetle. Most of them, you'd never know they were there. At least, you're not supposed to. It's not a good sign if they make themselves known to you. It usually means they want you out. My house is old lonely. Which pretty much guarantees there's a human ghost in it. It's small and creaky in a small mountain town in the south of Taiwan. Three hour journey away from the closest decent sized city. It wasn't an exciting place to live, but I was happy here. Never was the sort of boy who wanted to run along and get in trouble. I like to read books alone in my room. Hike the well-known mountain paths. Pretending to be a bold jungle explorer. Now you'd know it in your gut if the ghost of your house didn't like you. Have you ever been house hunting and found the perfect place? Didn't sign the lease um, because you felt that, that something was just off. That's the ghost telling you to go away. If you don't listen, you're asking for bad fortune. My parents... We're pretty sure our ghost liked us, or at least tolerated us. They'd leave offerings for it sometimes. There were times I spied a shadow that wasn't ours or sensed eyes watching for the shadow. But I was never afraid. How I knew the ghosts were okay with us. I was a bit of a coward as a kid, too scared even to read horror novels or 
The fact that I wasn't frightened of a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye made me confident that we had a benevolent ghost. The idea that I wasn't alone was almost comforting to me. On rainy nights when my parents were away, I'd curl up in bed reading and feel a presence in my room. I always thought of it as a friend. So I felt so betrayed when the ghost tried to murder me. I, it happened quickly. I was walking with my nose buried in a book when I heard the rush of sudden footsteps and saw a small figure, long, dark hair flowing across the face, darting out of the shadows. Then something slammed into me and knocked me down the stairs. At least, tried to. I grabbed the edge of the wall just in time to break my fall. I looked back to see the figure scampering across the floor on all fours. Her movements unnaturally fluid. Hey, I said indignantly. In the shock of the moment, my outrage outweighed my fear. That was my ghost. What was that for? She disappeared into the shadows. I didn't tell my parents about it in case they insisted we move. I decided I could handle this on my own. I clearly offended the spirit of my house. And so I had to make things right. After thinking about it for a while, I suddenly realized what the problem was. I'd recently come into possession of a number of well-known, uh, 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 dirty magazines. One of my friends from school had given them to me with a conspirational wink. It was, um, it was clear now that the ghost was a girl. Obviously, she thought I was a, a filthy pervert. She didn't like it. I went outside early one morning. I burned them in the yard. Then I turned back to the house and said, sorry. I was only curious. I'm not I'm not really a pervert. I haven't even kissed a girl before. The wind's howl sounded like a sigh. Then I realized it was a sigh. And that the person who sighed was standing right behind me. I yelped in shock and turned around. The ghost girl looked at me. Out in the sunlight, her hair no longer covered her face. She didn't look dead at all. She was young, my age maybe. A little older. I didn't want to hurt you, she said. It wasn't because of anything you did. I was dumbfounded. I had always known she existed, so I wasn't that shocked, but spirits weren't supposed to appear in broad daylight and talk to you. Oh, uh, I mean, it's good, I suppose, but why? Don't you know that a house spirit can only leave if they find someone to take their place? You love this house. You're, you're already bound to it. If you died here... You've become the new ghost that lives here. And you want to leave? Of course! I'm not bound here by happy memories. I was murdered here. I'm bound to this place by suffering. Oh. I folded my arms. I'm sorry. But that's... That's not my fault. And you've been happy here with us, haven't you? We've always treated you with respect, so I think it's pretty mean of you to decide to kill me all of a sudden. Her expression darkened for a second. Her face distorted into something that was not quite human, and her teeth suddenly looked sharp. My stomach twisted in sudden fear, but my eyes, my eyes fixed on hers. Then she looked down. I know, but it's different for you. You'd be happy here. I know you. I've known you all your life. You live in your own imagination. You love to wander the woods, gaze at the lake. You have a peaceful soul. If you took my place, you could stay here forever, and you'd be happy. I opened my mouth to argue, but then I closed it again. She did seem to know me pretty well. There are many moments, quiet moments, in the trees, listening to the wind, where I wished I could just freeze time. But what happened to you? I said at last. I don't know. I guess I'd go where normal dead people go. Maybe they stop existing. I don't know any more than you do. I, I don't mind not existing. You don't? The idea of nothingness, just blank, blank, endless non-existence, was terrifying to me. I I'd stay up at night trying to wrap my head around the concept of oblivion. Of course, it was impossible to imagine it, but I couldn't help trying. No, I wish I'd never been born. We looked at each other in silence. The sun was beginning to set. My parents would be home soon. How long have you been here? I asked at last. I don't know. A long time, I think. I've seen many people born and die here. You've been here for dozens of lifetimes at least, then. I'm only 13. I'm not ready to die and become a ghost. I don't want to make my parents unhappy. I, wa I want to see the world. I want to live for a long time, work in an office, become important. 
but when the time comes to die, I promise I'll come back here. You can wait for one more lifetime, but you have to promise not to hurt anyone. She was quiet. Okay, she said. I promise. The wind blew again, and she melted away into the summer air. I never saw her again. But I still talked to her like an old friend, even if I couldn't see her. I knew she was listening. I told her about my first broken heart. I felt a soothing hand touch my hair as I cried into my pillow. I grumbled to her about stupid teachers as I worked on my homework late at night. When I was 18, when I got accepted into my dream university in the United States, I told her I was going across the ocean to study. I heard weeping echoing through the house that night. That was 70 years ago. I lived well. I got my degree. I lived in the States for 10 years before I got a job in Shanghai. I got married. Had two kids. Five grandchildren. I've done well enough to leave behind a sizable inheritance. My parents lived in that house for many years after that. The ghost kept her word. Didn't hurt them. They even told me about a strange incident once. They'd, they'd arrived home after a trip and found the house broken into, but nothing was missing and there was spots of blood on the floor. The police asked him if they had a dog because it looked like the burglar had been injured and left in a hurry. We never had a dog. I've had many homes since then. Apartments, dorms, big houses. I always talk to them. I greet the spirits politely. When I walk through the door, I chat to them as I do my housework. I always say goodnight when I leave. Thank them for watching over me. I've been feeling homesick recently. My wife, my wife's been dead for three years now, and my children are all grown up and successful, and they'll all be fine without me. I'm still healthy. <laughs> At my age, you never know what'll do you in. No point waiting around to find out. I'm thinking it's time to go home. I know she's waiting for me. I miss that old house, the mountain air, and the forests, and those familiar paths. And I'm ready. I'm ready to keep my promise. I don't ever want to fade away into the dark. Something lives in the warehouse. I don't know what it is, but it's probably been there for a long time. Long before I started exploring the place, at least. A massive warehouse, just outside the city limits of my mid-sized hometown in the middle of nowhere. There's at least five stories to the thing, and I've only ever explored the first and second. It's big enough that the mazes of shipping containers are all hiding new surprises. Nooks, crannies, home to dust, pests, and the occasional odd trinket that I'd pocket. Nothing massive. I've looked in a couple of the old crates, too. Stuff stored there was mostly just clothes. The place has been abandoned for long enough that most of it's just rotted away, been eaten away by moths as time goes by. Thing is, the clothes, or whatever else used to be kept there, aren't what really makes the place interesting. I started noticing a pattern of weird noises somewhere around my fifth or sixth trip. Scraping sounds, like... Like someone was moving a box on one of the floors high above me. Something that sounded like footsteps. But far slower than a human's. The rustle of something soft being moved around, something far too close for comfort. The acoustics of the warehouse seemed to conduct sound particularly well, so even though I could tell most of the noises were far away, I could still discern what they were, or what they might have been. As freaky as the sounds were, I was only mildly concerned, and nothing came from them for a while. Nonetheless, I wondered... Was it ghosts? Squatters? Looters? Someone else? Eventually I found out that it wasn't just someone else, but something else entirely. It was easily my 15th or 16th trip there. I opened the door and the rusty hinges creaked in protest, but I learned to ignore them at that point. Nobody ever seemed to be worried about the place, so I wasn't concerned about the cops being called or anything. 
As usual, the hinges didn't seem to scare away whatever was making the noises because they, they started up again as soon as I had begun my walk towards the second floor. As my flashlight shone across the stacks of metal and wooden crates that bordered my path, I heard whatever it was moving around on the floors above me. The slow tap, tap, tap of footsteps. The scraping of crates. None of it concerned me. This time, though, I was more curious than anything else. I could keep exploring the warehouse methodically, sure. But the noises. The hell is going on? I was filled with a sudden determination. Screw looking around the rest of the place, I'm gonna go see what's up there. I kept walking towards the stairwell that would take me to the upper floors of the building. Purpose fueling my steps this time instead of just a hobby or vague interest. As I ascended the stairs, I briefly paused on the second floor landing, considering abandoning my investigation and going back to my old pastime. Then I shook my head to myself. I already decided, and the noises aren't going to stop anytime soon. I turned and kept climbing. Might as well. I was having trouble determining where the sound originated from. At first, I stopped on the landing of the fourth floor and listened, tilting my head, trying to decide from the intermittent sounds of moving crates and slow footsteps if they were coming from this floor or the one above me. Okay, they might be from this floor, I thought, but they might be from the fifth floor. I shrugged and I turned to climb the stairs going up. I'll get up there and listen, decide that way. The moment I stepped on the fifth floor landing, I knew that the sounds originated here, not from the fourth floor. The way the warehouse carried sound made everything seem louder than it actually was, so the clattering boxes and even footsteps were clear. I reached for the door to push it open and it froze, suddenly, apprehensive. What if it's dangerous, I thought. Maybe it's a homeless person off their rocker. No, no, I already committed, I thought, resolved. Not going back now. I slowly pushed the door open and leaned around it, ready to close it in front of me at the first sign of something being wrong as I shined my flashlight around the room. Instead of the cluttered space that I had expected, this floor looked nothing like the others. Where the other floors had boxes stacked all around the place, surrounding the support beams and bordering the paths, all the boxes on this floor had been removed from the center, instead lining the edges of the main room. The only exception to this was a pile of crates stacked in the middle. The rest of the place was clear, water dripping from the ceiling and into the floor next to the crates. The drip, drip, drip. Strangely quiet in comparison to the other noises. What the hell? I murmured aloud to myself as I stepped fully into the room and let the door swing shut behind me. I swept my flashlight around again, scanning the towers of boxes as I approached the one in the center. About three quarters of the way there, I heard something to my left. I stopped in my tracks, whipping my flashlight around to face the source, and saw something vanish behind a stack of crates, too fast for me to know what it was. I paused, frozen for a moment. Do I investigate the movement? Or the crates? I swallowed nervously. I'm closer to the crate, so I might as well take care of that first. I slowly moved towards them, keeping my flashlight in the place that I'd seen the movement for a few moments more. When nothing else happened, I relaxed a bit and turned to face the center crate. I inspected the one directly in front of me. It was wooden, nailed shut, firmly enough that I, I certainly wouldn't be able to pry it open without a crowbar. Luckily, I wouldn't have to open it to know what was inside. The block letters printed on the side read, Feathers. Feathers, I murmured to myself. I guess for stuffing pillows, things like that, I surmised with an internal shrug. I turned my flashlight upward to scan the pile. It looked like all the crates were the same. I frowned. Why feathers? My brain froze in place when I heard something move to my right. I whipped around, and one more time my flashlight caught something vanishing behind a pile of crates. Hello? I called, my voice surprisingly steady for the amount of adrenaline pumping through my system. Who's there? I didn't get a verbal response, but I heard a familiar rustling noise. The sound of something soft being shifted that I recognized from the other times I heard it during my exploration sessions. I blinked. Is this whatever's been making the noise? Uh, hello? I called again, taking a step towards where I'd seen the movement. When catastrophe failed to strike, I took another step and then another. I've, uh, 
I've heard you making sounds up here for a while. The rustling happened again, accompanied by a couple of those tapping footsteps. What is it? Um, I'm not here to hurt you or anything like that, I said, trying my best to come across as reassuring and friendly. I'm just curious. Uh, did you, did you put these crates here? I got no response for a few moments as I got closer and closer to reaching the edge of the room. I stopped before I reached the crates stacked there, shining my flashlight into the wide gap between two crates. If it was you, then what? I started. But stopped as something stepped out slowly from behind the box stack to the right. A pale, human face. No eyes. Far taller than any human should have been. I backed up a step and felt my hands start shaking. This thing's face rode the edges of the uncanny valley. It looked human, but it didn't move. It didn't emote. It, it lacked anything organic aside from its shape. A white oval caught in the beam of my flashlight. Uh... uh. I was completely lost for words. Uh, hi. The face moved. But it wasn't just a face. The, the mask-like visage was attached to a tall creature, easily twice my height, shaped like a bird with a long neck bent like a vulture's. Their entire body, aside from their long legs and feet, were covered in brown feathers, neatly preened and soft-looking, and their back was hunched, placing their face on a level with the rest of their body. I scanned downward from there. Their legs were long, stilted. Their feet were strangely small when compared to the rest of them, the nails sharp and clean, the source of the slow, even tapping footsteps. Their wings, instead of being folded like a normal bird's, hung down at their sides. At the joint where the claws would be on a pterodactyl, there was instead a pale set of human hands. Their movements were slow, calculated. They tilted their head for a moment, thoughtful, and then started walking towards me. Hey, I, I, I didn't mean to, like, uh, I, I intrude or anything, I said hurriedly, holding my free hand up and starting to move back very quickly. I can, I can leave if you, if you, if you, whoa! I stumbled and fell, landing hard on my ass. I s sat there for a second, startled. But as the thing approached, I very quickly became more concerned with them than with my fall. Ah, uh, uh, I struggled to think of bargaining chips that I could use to get this thing not to hurt me as I scrambled backwards on the ground. I... Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to trespass or anything, uh, uh, I'm not, I promise I'm not here to hurt you. I bumped into something, and realized I'd reached the stack of feather-filled crates in the middle of the room. The water from the leak on the ceiling landed on my right shoulder, and I jerked away from it in an instant. It smelled foul, the stench of rot hitting my nose like a truck, and further confusing my brain. The creature was too close to me to escape the other side, so I pressed myself against the crate behind me, trying to get as far away from them and the leak as possible. I squeezed my eyes shut. Please, please don't hurt me. I prepared myself for whatever means of attack this thing would utilize. To my surprise, though, an attack never came. Instead, they patted me on the head. I opened my eyes, surprised, as they lowered their hand. The feathers rustling, they observed me for a moment longer, head tilted, then bobbed it a couple of times as if to assure me. Without further ceremony, they turned away from me and walked back towards the crates they'd first emerged from. I stared at them for a moment, then stood somewhat shakily. Uh, all, all right, cool. Um, did, uh... Did you put the crates here? They stopped and turned to face me. For a moment, I, I wondered if they even understood English, but then they nodded at me. All right. They turned back and kept walking towards the crates. I hesitated for a moment, then followed them. Um, if you don't mind me asking, I said, still somewhat nervous, but a little reassured by the creature's actions. Why stack the crates like this? Are you... Are you just organizing? The creatures shook their head as they made their way around the crates. I followed behind them, not too closely, but closely enough to see what they were doing with my flashlight. Oh, uh, what for? Uh, if, you, if you don't mind me asking, I added, repeating myself just in case. They turned back to me and held up a finger, as if to say, wait a moment. Then they pointed to the flashlight in my hand, then a small stack of crates next to us. I blinked at them. What? Oh, oh, here. 
I shined my flashlight on the crates, trying my best to illuminate as many as I could. They nodded, seemingly satisfied, then bobbed their head back and forth, scanning the pile. Uh, if you're looking for another feather crate, there's one right there, uh, close to the top, I said, somewhat tentatively, pointing to it. They followed where I was pointing and looked up at the crate, then nodded happily at me. I nodded back with a nervous grin. The creature began to climb into the stack, easily scaling it with their long, steady legs, using the crates like stairs. At no point did they lose their balance, no matter how precarious they appeared to be perched on the thin ledge. When they reached the crate of feathers I'd pointed out, labeled with the same block letters as the others in the center of the room, they placed their hands to either side of it, and I realized how overall frail they looked. Suddenly I wondered if they'd even be able to get the crate down. Uh, I'd be careful if I were- They started. But to my surprise, they lifted the box with ease. They climbed down from the crates with the same grace they used to scale it in the first place, then stepped around me and the other crates, making their way back to the center of the room. Again, I followed them, shining my flashlight upon the stack of boxes. I watched as they started to climb, and I suddenly realized that they'd arranged the crates in such a way they acted like a staircase, enabling them to make it up higher up the stack with ease. I watched them silently as they climbed. When they reached the tallest part of the stack, they stopped and tilted their head, seemingly thinking. After a moment, they placed the box in front of them, and they shifted it from left to right, not satisfied with its exact position. I recognized these as the scraping sounds I'd heard from below in the previous expeditions. Curious, I glanced down at the crate nearest to me, and nudged it with my foot, or tried to, because, because it didn't budge. The crates of feathers were apparently very heavy. Too heavy for me to move at all with one foot, but not too heavy for the masked creature to carry. Are you building something? I called up to them. They adjusted the crate a couple more times, then nodded at it, seemingly satisfied, before looking down at me and nodding again in response to my question. What is it? Stairs? They nodded at me again as they walked down their makeshift steps, steady, never wavering or stopping to catch their balance. I frowned a bit. Stairs to what? They reached the bottom and pointed at the ceiling. I raised my eyebrows at them. Isn't, isn't this the top floor? They shook their head and pointed again at the ceiling more emphatically. There's another floor. I started to ask, but then stopped as I looked up bringing my flashlight beam with me to see more easily. There was a hole in the ceiling. It wasn't what was unnerving about it, though. It was what I could see and what I couldn't see that scared me. The light from my flashlight just seemed to stop when it reached the ceiling, as if refusing to go past the edge of the hole. Beyond that, there was nothing but a silent, oppressive void. Nothing but shadow, darker than the night sky outside. Nothing except a pair of perfectly circular white eyes. I was paralyzed with a sudden dread, my mouth half open where it had stopped when I was speaking. My flashlight beam wavered slightly with my trembling hand. I asked in a shaky whisper. The masked creature simply looked at me and shrugged. They didn't seem afraid at all. Are, are you, Are you building the stairs to get up to that? They shook their head. Are you... I swallowed my mouth dry. Are you helping it... get down? They paused. They nodded. Something lives in the warehouse's attic. And it drooled on me. Have you ever woken up in a bright white room unable to move, watched by people you can't see? I bet you have. Let me explain. I've been suspicious of dreaming for a while. It's always bothered me how people can never, never seem to accurately remember what happens when they sleep, even after training. Once I was out of school, this interest became something of an of a obsession. I, I bought a dream journal. I began writing in it every morning. The results were disappointing. June 18th, dreamless night. 
June 19th. I think I remember walking around in a meadow. Was it a park? June 20th. I was inside. My journals were so vague that I couldn't help but feel frustrated. College never went anywhere for me. While I did graduate, it wasn't with any amount of honor or in a field I enjoyed. That being said, I at least had some money for my part-time dead-end job at a gas station, so I could at least pay the bills for my crappy apartment and have some leftover. I didn't have enough for a camera, though. So I decided to record myself with my phone set up on a couple of books instead. Nothing. June 21st. I remember the sound of the ocean, but nothing else. June 22nd, dreamless night. June 23rd, I remember lying down in a room. I couldn't feel because it was a dream, but I could tell it was cold. I finally remembered more than vague details in a dream, but it still felt dissatisfying. It was the first dream that I could remember since I started keeping track, and it didn't have a plot, just a sense of cold and unease. I know I had dreams in the past. As a kid, I could still vaguely remember going on grand adventures in my sleep, filled with the same sense of majesty and grandeur that I used to have. I stopped having elaborate dreams, or at least ones that I could remember, sometime in college. I assumed it was because of the stress from work and moving out on my own, so I hoped that my dreams would come back to me once that ended. June 24th, I remember seeing someone talking to me, but I was unable to respond. June 25th, dreamless night. Three parts hydrogen peroxide, two parts honey, four parts water. Administer intravenously. Remember! June 26th, dreamless night. After I wrote my log for June 8th, I noticed that it seemed I'd skipped the page. I looked at the page before to see instructions. It looked like some demented recipe for a lethal injection, but it, it felt stranger than that. First of all, it was definitely in my handwriting, but it was much more frantic than anything I'd written in the journal. The page itself showed signs of being abused and crinkled in places from how, I, how hard I must have pressed down the pen. Secondly, the way it ended scared me. Remember. But I didn't know what it was referring to. I didn't remember writing down any of it. I decided to push the incident to the back of my mind. I figured it was just some weird dream that I had in the middle of the night that my mind cleared out before I woke up again. I still couldn't help but feel a little nervous about the note, however. It just didn't seem right. Remember. June 27th. Dreamless night. Remember. June 28th. Dreamless night. Remember. Check desk drawer. Remember. June 29th. Cold. I quit my job on June 11th. I know it sounds crazy, but it was a dead-end job anyway. It would have helped me in the long run to leave. I checked my drawer that morning to find a dozen small white pills in an unlabeled bottle. After I came home from work, I must have stared at the bottle for hours, wondering if I was going crazy. I decided that I would already made one rash decision that day, so I might as well make another. And I downed one of the pills before I went to bed for the night. The pill almost made me gag when it entered my mouth. It tasted nothing like a normal pill, but rather sour and bitter. About half an hour after the ingestion, I began to feel the effects while I was lying in bed. I could feel my heart rate increasing and my vision begin to blur. I remember panicking, realizing that I shouldn't have just popped some random pills I found on my desk, but my movements felt so slowed down by the drug that I couldn't get out of bed. And the last thing I remember was my body starting to go numb before I slipped out of consciousness. June 30th. I was in a white room with bright lights affixed somewhere I couldn't make out on each wall. Surrounding me were a few people in white suits, whose faces I couldn't remember, who seemed to be observing me. I was stuck in some kind of cold metal table, but I don't remember being strapped down or actually affixed to the table. There was a door off to my right, but I couldn't see beyond it. Remember the syringe. Remember. Remember. I woke up the next morning a few hours after my usual time, and a halfway across my apartment from where I usually slept with my face pressed against the wooden floor of the hallway. My body also felt like crap, as if I had a hangover, but it wasn't too debilitating. I made my way back to my bedroom to find my bed a mess, and my journal wide open with the pen lying next to it on the floor. I began to chastise myself for taking some random expired pills in the desk drawer and suffering the consequences. I picked up the sheets and threw them back into the bed, plopping down on top of them and taking a dejected look at my journal. However... I was excited by what I actually found. 
The pill I took seemed to actually work in assisting me with remembering my dream, but the dream itself unsettled me. It seemed eerily similar to the vague details I remembered from past nights, and the scrawled text telling me to remember was still there. What was I supposed to remember, though? Was there something else other than the dream? As I thought about this, I realized that while the dream was recorded in the journal, I had no memory of it now. I reasoned that the only way I was going to actually remember that dream was to use the syringe. The handwriting still all looked like mine. If I was going crazy, at least, at least I could trust myself. I went out to the store to buy what I needed. A hypodermic needle, a bottle of hydrogen peroxide, some honey. And once I got home, I put the ingredients together. I stared at what I created. It was dark, thick, it smelled like death. I blocked out the voice in the back of my head telling me to stop and poured it into the syringe before hiding the syringe in the back of my kitchen drawer. After doing so, I sat down in the middle of the kitchen, unable to fully process what I was doing. Was I about to poison myself over a dream? However, upon returning to my room as the sun set, I saw all the reassurance I needed in my journal. I grabbed three pills out of the dust drawer. I wanted to be sure that the effect would hit me quickly and strongly enough so that I could experience the dream to its fullest. After I downed them, I immediately felt my senses dull, and I let myself fall onto my bed. I steeled myself for what comes next. I woke up to find myself in a familiar white room. The room was brightly illuminated, but I couldn't see any lights. It felt more as if the walls themselves gave off a glow. The table I was on seemed to be made out of the same material as the walls, and it was cold to the touch. The room was filled with a low, humming buzz, like that of a fluorescent light, but louder. There were three people standing around me in what looked to be white hazmat suits with dark visors covering their faces. Moving felt difficult, but with effort I found I was able to separate myself from the table. I sat up halfway to get a better look at my surroundings, and the three people in the room jerked their heads over and stared at me. One of them approached the table and began to speak in a deep voice that sounded almost robotically smoothed. So, it appears you're moving now. The man spoke, placing a hand on my shoulder. Don't try to do it too much. You wouldn't want to strain yourself. Where am I? You aren't supposed to know that, and I can assure you a name would have no use to you anyway. What's that supposed to mean? The point is... You aren't supposed to be able to be aware enough to have this conversation in the first place. It's clear your subconscious has been collecting materials to form a resistance against our inhibitors. Inhibit? What? Why? What are you, what are you going to do to me here? You know, we aren't going to tell you anything. So why do you insist on asking? I can tell you that I'm going to use a more powerful inhibitor to knock out your subconscious for good. And after that... You'll have no memory of any of this, and it won't be your problem. It, it absolutely will be my problem. What are you, what are you going to do to me after this? What we do with your body while you aren't using it, none of your business. Upon saying this, he pulled out a small syringe with an orange fluid in it and pushed me back down onto the table. With the difficulty I had moving earlier combined with him holding me down, there was no way I could escape his grasp. As he brought the syringe closer to me, I noticed something. One of the other people standing in the room pushing open a section of wall opposite my table with almost no resistance. That if I was able to move around without being noticed, it may be possible to escape through that door. But it was too late to think about that. Unless I was able to overpower whatever he was about to do to me, I'd have no chance of seeing this dream again. I then felt the syringe pierce my neck and fill my veins with cold liquid that immediately made me black out. When I came to, I was... I was sitting upright in my bed, covered in a cold sweat. My head felt like it was going to split open, and my vision was still very blurry. However, I knew what I needed to do if I wanted to remember the dream and prevent the injection from taking its effect. I half ran, half crawled to the kitchen and opened the drawer to find the syringe I had prepared earlier that day. As I hold it in my hands now, I can feel the memories of the last few days slowly seeping away. The liquid still looks like death. But I feel sure it won't kill me. That's what they want me to think, right? I hope to God. I'm not crazy.
I used to be a reality hacker, and no, it's not what you'd think. I don't have some kind of supernatural or metaphysical powers. I just exploited real life the way that a hacker would exploit electronics or computer systems. Just like a computer hacker wanders the dark web in search of information or restricted corporation systems. I traverse the city looking for shortcuts through infrastructure or in search of things no one else knew about. I don't really like the term though, even if the parallel I just explained makes sense. I don't understand why they have to be called something stupid like reality hacking. I prefer urban spelunking myself. I think the comparison to actual spelunking is more accurate, and it's a fun word to say. My best friend AJ and I would explore all the little nooks and corners and crannies most people don't even know exist. Drains, abandoned buildings, closed subway tunnels. We hacked things like that. We bent or broke the rules for curiosity's sake and our own amusement. Do you remember that old bootleggers hideout that was discovered last year in the city subway system? AJ and I found it while exploring an old tunnel. Of course, we didn't get credit for the fine. We couldn't. We weren't supposed to be there in the first place and sure as hell weren't going to let any authorities know what we were doing. Instead, I told my buddy Jerry, who works for the Public Works Department, about it. He ended up on the local news and got some kind of award for the local historic association. We didn't mind. For us, the thrill was the find. I remember when we first got into the place, how we, how excited we were. The place was really dusty. Clear sign that no one had been there for years and years. We found something everyone forgot or never knew existed in the first place. We never found anything like that again. The rush of the unexplored, the thrill of the unknown, kept me exploring all throughout high school and college. AJ and I spent the summer after our freshman year at the community college exploring the city's storm drains. We had a lot of fun doing it. If you don't mind a little humidity and the occasional bad smell, you could get across town without worrying about traffic or pedestrians. Sure, we could always drive like regular people. We both had cars, both traffic can get pretty bad in our city. A good shortcut could come in handy sometimes. One day in the middle of August, we went to a park across town for a pickup game of football. It was late in the afternoon and traffic was bumper to bumper, so we took a shortcut through one of the drains on our way home. We made good time and cut a few blocks out of our trip. To tell the truth, we were a little smug about our subterranean shortcut. I mean, who else could get across town as quick as we could without awkward hops over fences and through backyards? Most drains are either simple tubes that force you to hunch over as you walk, or there are larger corridors like tunnels with raised ledges for walking. The one we took was a tube, and normally I don't enjoy those, but this one was not very long, so I put up with it. The last rain was weeks ago, and the drain was pretty dry, making an easy go for it. Our footsteps and banter echoed down the circular tunnel, and the cool underground air felt refreshing after the heat. Our route was more or less a straight line that cut through the large hill. It connected the main drain system at a single point near the entrance by the park, where we played football. So imagine my surprise when we ran across a fork in the drain that we could have sworn wasn't there last time. We stood there looking at it for a long time, and finally AJ spoke. I didn't know this was here. Me neither, I said. How could we have missed this last time? Now, neither of us were fools. Whenever we explored, we always tried to find out as much as we could about where we went. Also, we always let people know where we were going. We searched the location before physically checking it out, bringing plenty of lights, survival equipment, stuff like that. Urban spelunking can be dangerous. And that's why we didn't just charge headlong down the new tunnel. We did what we always did. We went home and investigated. After getting back to my place, we did some digging on the internet, but the tunnel wasn't on any of the city's maintenance maps or in any public works records we could find. I called my friend Jerry from the city public works department, but he didn't seem to know about it. Now there's no branching drain off that one, Jerry said. Are you sure you were where you thought you were? Yeah, man, I'm telling you. There's another drain down there, I said. Well, I'm off for the next couple days. Gonna finish up north. You gotta check it out? Yeah, probably this weekend, yeah. All right, I'll tell Bob you'll be down there just in case you get in trouble, Jerry said. And after a few pleasantries, we hung up. Try as we might, neither AJ nor I could find anything out about this tunnel, but we did figure out a few things. First, we were pretty sure it wasn't in use. The city had an older drain system that no longer was in use and we figured this new one was part of it. We ventured a little way down the new route when we first found it, just to see if it was a tunnel or a room of some kind. AJ noticed that the connection was pretty rough, not smooth like a connected tunnel. Maybe the tube-style tunnels are modular, like PVC pipes. They don't cut the drain tubes to make a connection. They use prefab joints. 
The connection from the main drain seemed like it was cut and then connected to the older one. Another thing that caught my attention was the lack of any kind of moisture. Most drains show at least a little evidence of dampness, even just dried leaves or debris, but this one was dry. That confirmed for us that this drain was part of the old system. We decided to explore it. Before we ventured down the tunnel, we took all our usual precautions, and a few more. We brought materials to map the place, chem lights to mark intersections, a GPS, and we let some friends know what we were going to do, and when we planned to come back. Sure, my backpack was heavier than usual, but better to play things safe considering we planned to venture into an unknown tunnel. It didn't take long for us to get to the access point, and while we walked into the intersection with the new tunnel, I found myself getting excited. I kept thinking back to the bootlegger's hideout that we found. Would we stumble upon something like that again? We might be able to take credit for it this time. That would be something. I was lost in those thoughts of grandeur and didn't realize that AJ had stopped walking. I bumped into him and he swore. Dude, really? He asked in feigned outrage. Sorry, man. I said, shrugging. Be a little more careful when we're going in. AJ said, pointing down the new tunnel. I was apparently so lost in thought that I didn't realize we had arrived. We stopped to check our gear and then made our way in. AJ went first, and I followed. When we started walking, we kept count of the number of steps we took. We knew from experience how many feet 100 paces would take us, what orienteering enthusiasts called a pace count. That helped us construct a fairly accurate map. We knew where the new tunnel branched off of from the old one, how many steps it took us to walk a certain section, and in which cardinal direction each turn led. We could even do this walking hunched over in a cramped space like this one, so even after a few twists and turns, we were still pretty confident of our location despite having walked about an hour. We decided to take a break and check our position, even though we felt pretty sure about our navigation skills. We were making a crude map based on our pace count and compared it to a city public works map. I guesstimated that we were near the slums, probably under Lake Street. We decided to check the first manhole that we found, verifying our position. I was also getting tired and a little sore from walking through the cramped space and needed to stretch. To our great satisfaction, we popped up onto Lake Street. Lake and Union, to be exact. It was a little odd, not because we were lost, we were actually right on the money, but because according to the public works map, no access points existed here. Still, we didn't question that, even if it did seem odd at the time. We were more surprised at what was on the street than a manhole that someone neglected mapping. Lake Street used to be nice a couple decades ago. Big houses lined either side, mostly run down and abandoned. These houses were close to a century old and dated back to the early days of the city, but gradually fell out of style as the years went on. Even in its dilapidated state, the neighborhood was still impressive. Most of the houses were at least three stories tall in an old Victorian style. I would have felt nostalgic for simpler times, but the whole thing wasn't so unexpected. I remember the house right in front of the manhole from which we exited was particularly impressive. I knew that some big houses still stood on the street, but this one was enormous. It was a four-story monstrosity of an old-fashioned mansion. Most of the windows were boarded up, the yard was overgrown, but it was clearly a nice place once upon a time. The sun was getting low and the late afternoon shadow obscured many of the house's details, but that also helped hide the blemishes of decay. Dude, AJ said after a few moments. I had no idea this was here. Yeah, me neither, I replied. Oh, we knew all the big old houses around here. Uh, well, apparently not. AJ turned towards me. You want to check it out? What, now? I asked incredulously. We don't even know if it's structurally sound. AJ gave me a look, which people reserve only for valley girls, old ladies at church, and lame practical jokers. I don't want to go inside, dumbass. Let's walk around outside and see if there's anything interesting. Uh, okay. I answered slowly. Walking around the outside couldn't hurt, I guess. I just wasn't sure why AG wanted to leave the unexplored tunnel behind. As if reading my mind, he spoke again. We spent most of summer underground, man. Let's enjoy some fresh air. We won't go inside, just walk the grounds. See if we could find anything out about it that way. You can always pick up the drains tomorrow. I thought for a second. I didn't see any fault in his logic, and some fresh air did sound good. Okay, I said. I'm game. I just don't want to hang out here forever. It's almost dinner time and I'm pretty hungry. Patted my stomach to emphasize the point, and AJ laughed. <laughs> yeah, me too. We can hit up a burger joint on the way back. Let's go. With that, we set off. Fighting a way into the yard wasn't hard since the fence was broken in many places. We didn't even have to jump it. Walking through the tall grass wasn't easy, though. 
I made a mental note to check myself for ticks when I got home. Circling around the house didn't get us much in the way of results, though. The side was just as boarded up as the front. No discernible way in or out caught our eye. Not until we made our way to the backyard, and suddenly, the ground gave way beneath us. One moment we were walking through the tall grass, and the next, our world dissolved into a torrent of dirt, broken wood, and gravity. Before we knew it, we found ourselves in some sort of cellar. We lay there in a daze for a minute, shocked by what happened. AJ groaned and sat up. I coughed and sputtered a bit. Apparently I got a mouthful of dirt on the way down. Guess I was too surprised to notice. The hell? AJ asked. You okay? I said, sitting up myself. Yeah, I think so. AJ stood up and brushed himself off. Sun's broken. I looked up, saw the hole in which we fell through. It's pretty high above us, so you had a reach. Broken plywood framed the edges of the hole. It's probably fairly rotten and gave way as soon as we put pressure on it. AJ, that's a long way up, man. I don't think we're going to get back out that way. AJ swore, yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I looked around, but I couldn't see much in the limited light of the ceiling. I took off my backpack, dug inside for a few seconds, and pulled out my flashlight. I turned it on and shined it around the room. It seemed to be a cellar typical for a house as old as this one, albeit deeper than usual. I saw a door at one end. AJ saw it too. Only one way out, eh? He said. I nodded and got up. We checked our gear, grabbed an extra light, and walked over to the door. It didn't seem like it was locked when I tested the knob, but an inexplicable feeling of dread came over me when I touched it. My skin prickled goose flesh, which caused me to shudder and jerk back my hand. The door opened. We both jumped at it. I was pretty sure that I hadn't turned the knob or even got my whole hand around it, but it opened anyway. We didn't lose our heads despite the surprise of the sudden open, for AJ and I moved to opposite sides of the door so that whoever had opened the door couldn't see us. Hello? I called after a few minutes. Is anyone there? Nothing but silence answered me. I looked at AJ and he shrugged. I frowned, but I didn't say anything. We moved in front of the door and shined our flashlights in. It looked like the perfect man cave from the late 80s. Pool table sat immediately in front of us, and on the opposite wall was a large screen TV that would have been top of the line sometime around 1985. Posters of action movies like Die Hard, Terminator, and Predator bedecked the wood panel walls along with some pro sports players like Larry Bird or Wayne Gretzky, an old swimsuit issue of Farrah Fawcett and Kathy Ireland. A couple cases of sports memorabilia stood against the left wall. It dispersed with the images of late 20th century testosterone, and a bar was on the right side of the room. Dust covered everything, except the carpet. Dim light filtered through gaps in the boards covering the windows. We fanned out. AJ went to look at the display case, and I examined the pool table. Near the pool table was an autographed poster of the NFL player William Perry. I remember the poster from when I was a kid because my older brother had one on his wall. Perry, nicknamed The Fridge, was smiling and leaning against a refrigerator, but in this one, his face was fixed into a snarl. His eyes seemed to be looking directly into mine, and I had the distinct impression that expression of hate was for me. I blinked, and The Fridge was back to the smiling football player that I remembered and not the hate-twisted visage I could have sworn was glaring at me a moment ago. I glanced over to AJ to see if he saw what I did, but he was crouching in front of a case of sports memorabilia. I gave the poster one more glance, then made my way over to AJ. As I walked to the case, AJ straightened up and said out loud, um, Dude, what the hell? He turned to look at me and pointed at the bottom shelf. I bent over to see what he was talking about. Right in the middle of the bottom shelf sat the strangest figure I had ever seen. There was two people laying on the ground with their stomachs ripped open and their entrails strewn about them. The really weird part is, they looked exactly like us. What? I said. Yeah, man. This is really weird. How the hell did these get here? This makes no sense, dude. We need to get out of here. Now. Yeah. Let's go. We moved with more than a little urgency to the door through which we came in, but out of shock it seemed to be locked again. Another door sat on the far side of the basement and we made a beeline for it. AJ wrenched it open. We could see stairs leading up to darkness. AJ started up the stairs and I started to follow. Before I could even climb one step I felt something touch my hair. The touch was so light that I could have imagined it. In fact, I thought I did until I felt breathing on my neck and heard faintly whispered words that I couldn't quite make out. 
I don't remember exactly what happened next, but I found myself at the top of the stairs. I must have sprinted up to the next floor so quickly that I didn't realize it. I could hear footsteps following me, and I thought I heard AJ call out. Hey, man! I watched the door open and then stopped dead. I was back in the basement, standing just inside the door we came through when we first entered the room. The only difference was that no light was coming through the windows now. The only illumination came from my flashlight. A sudden noise made me jump and drop my flashlight. The door behind me slammed shut. The flashlight rolled away from me towards the center of the room, throwing crazily spinning shadows all over the room. I moved forward to retrieve it, but a sudden motion made me freeze. Something was moving around us at the light. Scuffling sounds came from the other side of the pool table. I peered at the table, trying to make out the shape in the limited lighting. It was already on the edge, and my fight or flight instinct was starting to kick into gear. And then, something grabbed my leg. I didn't want to see what it was. I just bolted. No flashlight, no plan. Just get the hell out. I reached the stairs and took them two at a time. I crashed through the door and found myself, thankfully, in another room. I looked around and saw that I was in some sort of space between a kitchen and a living room. The kitchen was on my left, the living room was on my right. A large sliding door was on the far wall in front of me, and a little bit of the evening light leaked through from where the boards that covered it didn't sit flush. Everything was covered in the same dust as the basement. Something was wrong, though. I, I couldn't put my finger on it, and then... Then it suddenly dawned on me. I could hear whispering. I didn't notice at first because my heart was racing and I was breathing heavy, but now that I started to catch my breath, I could hear it. Faint whispers, like, like the ones I heard at the bottom of the stairs, seemed to be coming from the living room. I was already on edge, almost panicking, and that set me over. I blindly rushed in the other direction and saw AJ just ahead of me. He looked like he was leaving the kitchen through an archway on the other side of the room. I started following him and then jumped when I suddenly heard footsteps pounding up the stairs. I leapt through the archway and came into some sort of living room or, or sitting room. Dodging indistinct blobs in the dark, I tried to keep up with the dim shape of AJ ahead of me. This room was darker than the kitchen. I, I, I had to slow down to avoid crashing into something in the dark even though the sound of footsteps behind me was growing louder. Even if it was a squatter or some crazy old resident who never left the place. Every instinct I had told me that I did not want to meet whatever was behind me in this house. The illumination from the street lights suddenly filled the room. AJ had managed to wrench open an exterior door, and the light illuminated the room enough for me to see my way. He stood silhouetted against the bright frame of the door for a second, and then disappeared outside. I sprinted for the door and did not stop until I was outside. I dashed across the large porch to the steps and into the yard. AJ stood there, bent over and breathing heavy. Holy hell, man. I said, panting. That was close. Yeah, he answered, his voice strangely flat. Close. I was about to ask him if he was okay when a voice came from behind me and cut me off. Dude, what the hell? You didn't wait for me? I knew that voice. He was AJ's, but AJ stood in front of me, gasping for air. After a mad dash out of the house, in which we accidentally fell, how could, how could he be behind me? I turned to look, afraid of what I might see. My stomach sank, and a cold feeling of dread settled over me as I saw what was behind me. It was AJ. He was walking down the steps with a concerned look on his face. Dude. The second AJ said. Who's that? The first AJ stood up. They both looked at each other, a curious expression on their faces. One that quickly changed into horror. I looked at both of them. Then back at the house. It stood silent and dark in the night, as though no one had even bothered it. No one spoke. Shit. Do you ever notice how many trees there are? I've heard it said that there are more trees than stars in our galaxy. That's amazing to think about, isn't it? That something as big as a star should be outnumbered by the trees on our planet. Or those in our galaxy, at least. That's a lot of trees. They're all very old, aren't they? So very old. Older than us. Maybe somewhere out there is a tree older than the dinosaurs. Buried in a mountain, somehow, somehow having survived millions of years. I know we find fossils of trees, but what if those fossils weren't dead? It's interesting to think about that, that there could be a tree out there older than all of mankind's history. Think trees have thoughts? 
After all, trees are alive and every living thing has some kind of mind and intelligence driving it. And if so, what do they think of us? I've got a fair idea what they think about humankind. I'm a park ranger. And this is my story. It all began when we got a call that none of us had been wanting to receive. A child had gone missing. This wasn't unusual. People go missing all the time in the parks. However, what made this one unusual was how it happened. Maxie Payton had been out with his mother in a picnic. At 13 years old, he was a wild and rambunctious child. And if there was one thing he loved doing more than any other, it was climbing trees. Now, if only he'd been more of a video game kid than an outdoors kind, then perhaps all this could have been avoided. See, it was when he was climbing a tree that he disappeared. His mother recounted everything in detail. They picked out a nice clearing in the edge of the woods, near a large clump of trees that Maxie could climb as he pleased. We set up the blanket right here. Maxie wanted to climb that big pine tree, she pointed at it. I took my eyes off him for only a moment. Just one moment, and when I looked back, he was... And she utterly broke down. The first thing we did was check out the tree in question. It was a pine tree, one of the tallest I'd ever seen. Clearly, it was very old. How high up was he when he vanished? I asked his mother. A little skeptical, a kid could just disappear without a trace while climbing a tree. He was... He was... Halfway up. Then she continued sobbing. After that, it was obvious we weren't going to get anything else out of her. Still... I walked around that tree twice and I could clearly see the snapped branches and twigs where Maxie had climbed up. They ended at about halfway up. It was like he just stopped climbing, then disappeared completely. We did a thorough search of the area first and found nothing. Well, almost nothing. See, about 50 yards from the pine tree, I found a shoe, covered in pine needles and tree sap. It was red and blue, a Nike brand symbol on the side. It seemed to have been there for a long while. But when I bent down and picked it up, what I found inside planted the first seed of doubt that this wasn't just a case of a woman losing track of her child. There, written in black permanent marker, was a name. Maxie Payton. So how did it get here? Maxie's mother was hysterical, and became even more so when I brought her the shoe. That's it! That's my Maxie's shoe! She grabbed it. Clutching it close to her chest, she wailed and wailed. We had to take her away. Taking the shoe from her was difficult, but both physically and emotionally, that woman held the shoe to her chest like it was a baby. I'll never forget how much that woman cried as she was taken away. Sad to say, but the shoe was the only evidence we had of Maxie and where he'd gone. She was escorted to the park center, where she'd wait for the paramedics. We know that she wanted to help, but in her condition, she'd only be a hindrance. The moment she was out of sight, however, was when one of my partners spotted Maxie's blue shirt at the top of another pine tree, hanging from a branch by the collar a hundred yards in the opposite direction of where we found his shoe. He swore up and down that the shirt hadn't been there when we first looked, and did so with such conviction that none of us doubted him, even if we wanted to. He knew we had to get that shirt down somehow, it was evidence, but then again, how had the shirt gotten up there? Unlike the pine tree Maxie had disappeared from, this one had no signs of anyone climbing it. No broken twigs, branches slightly bent from where someone had climbed up and left the shirt. There were five of us when we went to first look for Maxie, excluding myself. We didn't think we'd need that many, because frankly, people go missing in the park all the time. Often they turn up in about a few hours. But we'd never dealt with something like this. Staring up at that shirt covered in pine needles, I think it began to dawn on all of us that we were dealing with something we weren't trained for. We radioed for backup while trying to figure out how to get that shirt down. I volunteered to climb up. The very first branch I grabbed, however, broke in half instantly. In the process, scratching me across the hand, I cried out looking at the gash across my palm. It wasn't deep, but the skin had been broken. Blood was already pooling in it. Groaning at the sharp pain, I clutched my hand in a fist, trying to stifle the bleeding. I glared, stunned, large branch which had just snapped when I touched it. My blood was already seeping down it towards the ground, where it dripped into the exposed roots of the pine tree below. Ugh, I cried, turning back around to the others while clutching my wounded hand and my still healthy one. Park rangers always carried a first aid kit on hand. 
and they quickly helped me apply a bandage to it, wrapping my hand in cotton. What happened? One of the other park rangers asked me, looking at the broken branch ludicrously. It just broke! I snapped back despite myself. My agitation at having been cut by the tree branch when it broke was severe, but then something else dawned on me. How had that tree branch cut me? It broke in the grasp of my hand and shouldn't shouldn't have been able to move in such a way as to leave a mark this painful. Inadvertently, a shiver went down my spine. I became acutely aware of how many trees were around us. Was I mistaken, or had their number increased since I'd last checked? I had to be mistaken. Let's just split up and find Maxie, another park ranger said. I was thankful, given it meant I didn't have to focus on trees anymore. What about this shirt? Another one said, indicating the garment at the top of the tree. We'll come back for it, the first one said dismissively. You know, it's strange. For the life of me, I can't remember their names. See, I was still new at the time, a rookie, really. I barely knew what I was doing. I never saw any of the other park rangers involved in the search for Maxie Payton again. Most of the retired or transferred to a different park, but sometimes... I do wonder if we all came back from the search. We split up into three pairs, moving in a perimeter from Maxie's last known location, the Pine Tree. I was paired up with a man whose name escapes me. I, I just know he's Hispanic, and that's all I can really remember about him. We were sent north in case Maxie, or whatever was left of him, had somehow gotten there. The others went east and west. If we found anything, we had to radio it in and then come back. If we found a body, we had to leave it undisturbed. That was obvious, of course, but I really hoped we wouldn't find anything. Because what we'd found so far just didn't sit right with me. How did his shoe get 50 yards from his last known location? As I thought back to the moment when I had found that shoe, I began playing it over and over in my head. Something was nagging me about it. A bell, said my partner. What? I replied. You ever climbed trees as a kid? I nodded. My face was beaming as I thought back to those happy days. When my partner grimaced, however, I blinked, confused. What's wrong? Shaking his head, my partner muttered something in Spanish under his breath before he answered. I did too. A few times, but... He stopped walking and turned to face me. One time, I was climbing a tree. Something happened. What? I asked, curious if this had anything to do with our current situation. I was back in Mexico, before my family immigrated to the States. There was a tree in my abuela's backyard. I climbed it every time I went over. One time, when I climbed to the very top, I was looking out over the entire land around my abuela's house. I felt like I was king of the world. And I saw it. Saw what? My partner didn't answer. He opened his mouth, paused, and then slowly closed it, shaking his head. You wouldn't believe me. Try me, I replied. He sighed then, opening his mouth to say something. When his eyes widened so large, he looked like a fish. He was looking at something behind me. Throwing my brow, I began to turn around when he grabbed my arm in a vice-like grip. Don't, he hissed. Don't look. I couldn't help myself. I wish I had taken his advice when my eyes found the blue shirt of a boy hanging from the bottom branches of a tree with a broken branch, probably about a hundred meters away. Blood was dripping from it onto the roots below. My heart began beating in my chest so fast I thought that it would burst. That's impossible, I muttered, and blinked. What I saw the moment my eyes opened will haunt me forever. The tree had come closer. My partner began cursing, letting go of my arm and stumbling back. He crossed himself, saying silent prayers. We have to go, he said with a shaking breath. No! I didn't argue. Instead, I began to run. Instead, I began running, my partner right next to me the whole time. I didn't dare look back once, and neither did he. All thoughts of finding Maxie were gone. For all intents and purposes, he might as well not have existed. At that moment, all that mattered was getting away from that tree. Exhaustion caught up with us eventually, though, and we stopped. Panting as we tried to catch our breaths. Did that just happen? I said through painful gasps of air. Did that actually just happen? I don't know, said my partner. Did you see it move? I asked him. No, but I saw the others moving. What? Their branches and leaves are moving. You heard them, right? I nodded. 
By this point, I was thoroughly done with everything. For lack of a better term, this was just too crazy. I watched them for a while, wondering why they were moving with no wind about them, then... Then... What? I asked him. He looked at me grimly in the eye. I saw a boy, he said. The branches moved aside only briefly, but I saw the body of a little boy. He couldn't have been more than thirteen, but... Amigo, we mustn't find that body. I didn't want to ask. Curiosity got the better of me. Why? Because a thing could never be called human. Not after they're finished with it. What do you mean, finished with it? My partner didn't answer. Instead, he began praying again in a shaking voice, crossing himself over and over. What happened to Maxie's body? I pressed, not consciously. He didn't answer me at first. Instead, he licked his lips, looking around us, eyes darting from one spot to another. When he spoke, his voice was low and shaking. Same thing I saw in my abuela's backyard when I was a child. I didn't say anything about that. I just sat on a stone, leaning backward until my partner grabbed my shoulder. Don't, he whispered. There's a tree behind you. I didn't need to look to know he was right. It was obvious, anyway. We hadn't left the forest, after all. What do we do? I asked him. I kept my eyes on his face intently because looking anywhere else meant seeing a tree. Ignore him. They might leave us alone if we do. So we did. We just sat on the ground, facing each other, catching our breath. I could hear the singing of birds, the gentle flow of a stream nearby, but the only thing I could pay attention to was the sounds the trees made. The soft creaking of wood, the swaying of leaves and branches on this windless day, the trees brushing against each other. Neither of us said anything, just looking at the ground to avoid the awkwardness of staring at each other's faces for who knows how long. The silence between us was marked by a tense patience. Something was going to happen. We could feel it. Even after running from that thing for God knows how long, I didn't believe we'd escaped it. It was still out there, waiting. Just like us. I've heard stories about how some hunters track their prey. They shot it first, critically wounding it, then follow the blood trail it leaves behind, waiting for it to collapse from exhaustion. Why bother letting it put up a struggle when you could just wait it out? I remember those stories when I looked at my hand. The cotton around my palm was soaked in crimson red. Why is this happening? I asked my companion. He said nothing, he just stared at the ground. I've never heard of this before, I continued, my voice dull and tired. I heard stories of Bigfoot and Mothman and freaking Dogmen in Michigan. Some people say they've seen aliens, other goblins and fairies. They always say they see them in the woods, peeking around a corner, watching them hiding behind something like a, a rock or a... Uh, I couldn't say it, because they were still all around us, listening. I've never heard of anyone being hunted by a tree. I said that. I don't know why I did. I guess I accepted the reality of what was happening. That it would make it easier. But it didn't. Because when my partner looked up at me suddenly, I could see it in his eyes. He was disappointed in me. I was talking in the presence of other trees. I didn't care. This was just too weird. Any rational part of my brain was long since dead, unable to deal with how bizarre this was. I wondered if my partner was going through the same thing. Then again, he claimed to have experienced this thing before. Are we sure they're trees? He said slowly. Like he was talking to a child. What? I answered. And eyes narrowed. My father once told me a story. It was about a demon possessing a woman he knew as a child. He said, she was stark raving mad, biting people, scratching her face. When he finished, I couldn't help but wonder if demons only possessed people. Are you, are you saying a demon has possessed a tree and is hunting us? Maybe, he answered. Who knows? I mean, how do we even know if that thing was a tree? It looked like one to me, I replied, trying not to peek over my shoulder to see if it was behind me. Trees don't move that fast. They don't carry on pieces of clothing. They don't, they don't chase people. You said you saw them with a boy's body, I pointed out. My partner swallowed, crossing himself. I did, I did. 
I wish I hadn't, but I did. And let me tell you, amigo, trees aren't capable of doing what was happening to that boy. I didn't say anything. The sun broke through the leaf canopy above us, and I squinted from the glare. So did my partner. Part of me thought that he'd made a compelling case, but another felt like there was something we were missing. Missing? That was it. When a tree falls, I said, and no one's around to hear it, what sound does it make? My partner furrowed his brow, confused. How do we know trees don't chase people down? How do we know they can't move in the blink of an eye or take a, take a young boy without anyone noticing and carrying away his body? What are you saying, that trees are capable of doing that? Maybe they are, I replied. Maybe we aren't the first I've seen them either. You think there might be others? When you were a kid, you saw something in your grandma's backyard, right? Something involving trees. Through the sun's glare, I could see his face going pale. Maybe you were one of the lucky few to live and tell the tale. What? He said, mouth hanging open. When a person goes missing in the savannah, some people believe they were killed by the local wildlife, and nobody doubts it. Africa is, is full of dangerous beasts. I let that sink in. Let my partner begin to understand what I was going to say before I finished. When a person goes missing in the forest, sometimes people assume they're killed by the local wildlife. Mountain lions, bears, wolves, but nobody stops and thinks about the trees all around us. Because nobody ever notices them. I pressed my lips together when I finished. My partner looked at me in disbelief and horror. Dumbfounded. Do you have any proof? Same amount of proof as you. For demons possessing trees. It's only a theory. Then my partner's face brightened with a dark realization. What if... What if we're both wrong? I blinked. My mind began racing with possibilities. What if we were both wrong? What if there wasn't trees or demons, but... Something else entirely? If it was, then... What was after us? I was about to say something when I noticed the shadow which had fallen between us, perfectly still on the ground like a border keeping us at bay, a long, thick black line, with several appendages sticking outward from it. My heart skipped a beat as my eyes widened. I knew my partner saw it when he cursed, screaming and backing away. However, there was only one part of the shadow which made my blood run cold. One of the appendages was broken, and from it hung the silhouette of a shirt. And slowly, very slowly, it was getting bigger. Unable to help myself, I began following the shadow's trail to its source, knowing full well what had made it. I could see it in my peripheral vision, like a patient hunter, waiting for its prey to roll over and die when I heard the most comforting sound in my life. The distant hum of a car speeding down the road running past us. I turned back to my partner, locking eyes with him. At that moment, we both had the same idea. It was our only chance of getting out of this nightmare. Neither of us knew it would work, but we didn't have a choice because the shadow had nearly doubled in size and a tree was cracking very loudly. We ran faster than I ever had in my life before or since. We ignored everything around us, especially the silent, inescapable trees. We ran across the roots, pushed through their leaves, ducking under their branches, swerving to avoid running into their trunks. I didn't care if I touched them anymore. If I was fast enough, I could get away from them. Then they wouldn't catch me. But what about that infernal creaking, always right at our heels? What would happen when it stopped? We couldn't be near it when that happened. Our very lives depended on it. So caught up in sprinting out of those godforsaken trees, I didn't think to look at my path. My foot hit something large and solid, and I cried out, losing my balance. My partner was in front of me and looked over his shoulder. Bewildered, he stopped and he reached out his arms. I grabbed one of them and planted my foot back on the ground, pushing myself forward. Both of us kept running. We didn't need to check on what I had tripped on. It was bound to happen at some point. We'd been running over them for ages. When we saw the gray asphalt on the road, my heart leapt for joy. The creaking behind us had become so distant, growing fainter and fainter. I knew damn well we were safe the moment we reached that road. And then I, I felt something brush against my back. Something I knew all too well. The hard, rigid texture of tree bark. Next thing I knew, I was lying on my back against the burnt asphalt. Panting as I caught my breath, my partner was bent over me, his face obscuring the sun. There were tears running down his face. I saw it touch you, he said to me, weeping. It was so close. 
So close, I've never seen anyone run as fast as you did. We're safe now. I began murmuring. We're safe. Praise the Lord, we're safe. I looked back at the woods we'd come out of. Marked by broken twigs and foliage pressed into the ground was the spot we'd both burst from onto the asphalt. Beyond it, I saw only trees and not a single blue speck anywhere. I smiled, relieved, and stood up, glancing to the other side of the road, and my smile vanished, and I saw the blue shirt laying on the edge of it. The inside of the collar was facing me, and on the white tag was a name written in black marker. Maxie Payton. I blinked. And it was gone. I didn't tell my partner. He thought we were safe. Why should I take that away from him? Instead, both of us went back to the ranger station, tired, thirsty, starving. The other pairs had already beaten us to the station. When we arrived, they had been trying to work on the radio, but stopped when they saw us come in. Nothing happened to them. They didn't find anything either. They didn't ask where we had been for the last three hours. They knew better than to do that. Nobody ever tried in the days that followed either. We didn't tell anyone about what happened. Some things are better left forgotten. A couple weeks later, my partner resigned. He cited intense emotional trauma as his reason. I did the same thing three months later. I didn't keep in contact with him. He, he didn't try to. Instead, I moved to the city, surrounded by buildings and cars and a modern world. I avoided the parks, botanical gardens, anywhere a single tree is. I stayed away from it. I always believed it was the only way to keep myself safe. I do enjoy going to a park. My apartment overlooks. There's no trees there, only grass and bushes. That is until... I'm not... I'm not sure what to do anymore. Because I had a dream last night. There was a there was a pine tree in my apartment. One of the lower branches was broken. I thought it was just a symptom of my trauma. And then I saw that tree in the park. And it's getting closer. Hey there once again, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And I just wanted to give you a big thank you for watching tonight's video. If you guys ever wanted to help support the show, you can always do so if you watch the show on youtube.com slash mrcreepypasta or find the Mr. Creepypasta Storytime podcast on iTunes, on Google Play, and on Spotify. And also, if you ever want to check out my wife's tea shop, it's etsy.com slash ivorymonaclete, where she sells hand-blended herbal teas in the theme of Dungeons and & Dragons and Harry Potter and Final Fantasy and the like. You can find the link for it, as well as many, many, many other links in the description down below. And, drumroll please, a big, big, big thank you to everybody supporting me at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. People such as... Tacia Lynn Ginobaga Arneo, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Dr. Strawberry, Chempinski, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Nicholas Saeed Elyasin, Buddy Burrows, Stephen Van Hus, Kai Albertson, Goonington, G Weevil 3, Chance Burnett, Diane Krause, Asia, Gabrielle DeBaca, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Cindy Barney, Titty Connoisseur, <laughs> really? Titty Connoisseur? Melissa Swagart, Dante Rao, Last Blade Song, Cross Rights, The Ginger Bros, Eliminator 86, Andrew Steinberg, Jason Sistma, Holy Realm, and Rafael Rodriguez. Thank you so much to you guys out there on Patreon, to all of you listening to either the podcast or the YouTube show. And that is everything, guys. Thank you so much for listening, and sweet dreams. <laughs>